Saul is well with you. Thanking the Lord we have this opportunity to meet. We've been in this uh, series called uh, Core Values, Find It Here. And uh, one of the core values that has been listed has been that core value of prayer. Uh, I have read this every week since we have been in this little short mini series on prayer. The transition team came up with these words, which reflect biblical truth. The core value is called being prayer dependent. And we enter into God's presence, recognizing our total dependence on him for all things, communicating our adoration, our confession, thanksgiving in needs. We might ask ourselves, what is prayer? And that is a, a very immense subject. It is immense because it is that aspect of our relationship with God that brings us into that intimacy with him. It is that aspect of our relationship with God where we recognize his nearness. It is where we have the opportunity and the privilege to draw near to him. And because God is spirit and we worship in spirit and truth, we have this wonderful privilege of entering into the presence of God in any context, any circumstance, any place. This relationship is not confined to any of those things. We are totally free with access to the Father in and through the person of Jesus Christ. Isn't that wonderful? There are a couple of definitions that we have looked at in the last couple of weeks. They're very simplistic, but they uh, bring attention to uh, a couple or, or a, a different uh, uh, perspectives on prayer. Uh, we have spoken of uh, Matt Slick's uh, uh, description of prayer, and he simply says this, it is the practice of the presence of God. James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to us. The practice of the presence of God. Isn't that wonderful that we can do that at any time? W.S. Bow says this, and I think all of us could recognize this and sets in a reality, something that's been expressed in our own lives very often. He says this, prayer is weakness leaning on omnipotence. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast uh, all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We're going to come back to that verse in just a moment's time. Our first week that we dealt with this core value of dependent prayer, we talked about the invitation of prayer. Remember, we used as our scripture reference, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, where it says, therefore, let us with confidence draw near. And the idea of the word there, confidence, is that which is spoken, speech. Uh, we could say it this way, God wants to hear from us. Isn't that interesting? He wants to hear from me. And we can draw with confidence in this speech to the Lord to what is called the throne of grace. Now, that introduces us to a concept of the, the loftiness or the highness or the sovereignty of God. It is a throne of grace. And then it brings us back down to earth and it says that we may receive mercy and find grace in a time of need. Then last week, we looked at the model or the framework of prayer. We utilized Matthew chapter 6 verses 5 through uh, 14, and then we made reference also to Luke chapter 11. And we talked about that passage of scripture where we are uh, instructed uh, on how to pray. Our Father 
who is in heaven. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And dear friend, we're going to be coming back to that point also, that little phrase, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. In the margins of my Bible, after having attended a conference on prayer, I uh, wrote down uh, the presenter's uh, simplistic outline on this passage of scripture. And it was this, he is worthy, we are needy. He is worthy, indeed he is, and we are needy. Yes, we are to pray for our daily sustenances, our daily bread. And we are to forgive our debtors as we forgive the debts of others. And we pray, Lord, please lead us not into temptation. We want to be led towards you. And oh, Lord, protect us from those evil temptations that are so real to all of us. This week, I would like to pay attention to the concept of the power of prayer. So before we do, may we just have a word of prayer. Lord, uh, we come to you because we recognize ourselves as needy people. And so we call upon you, the Father in heaven. And Lord, we're looking for your will to be done and accomplished even in the teaching of your word, that we might have the right understanding, the proper understanding of your word, that we recognize that we come to one who is sovereign in his due reverence. And yet, Lord, you invite us where we can bring our petitions and make requests of you, our daily needs, our daily bread. And so, Lord, we give you the glory. We give you the praise. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit and his ministry in and through our lives. Be our instructor now that Christ might be glorified and lifted up, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we start on our uh, time in power of prayer, I actually would like to make some introductory uh, comments on the power of prayer. Let's be clear. The power of prayer has nothing to do with the merit of our prayers. The power does not reside with us. It resides with God. Does prayer influence God? Yes. But it's in the context of his desire to draw us near to him and let our request be made known. You remember, we're instructed in scripture in Hebrews chapter 4 that we can come with confidence to draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive that mercy and find grace in the health time of a need. But this is not because he does not know our needs. He's not sitting in a gallery and making observation. Oh, that's what Dan needs. No, the scriptures speak of his omniscience or his knowing everything. He is knowing of everything and he knows my needs. But prayer is this wonderful privilege that we have of entering into the presence of God. It's of deep intimacy. And when we turn towards him, that's prayer, when we turn towards him, we are, as Mac Slick says, practicing the presence of God. God answers prayer, but he answers prayer on his own terms and always consistent with his unchanging character. Hebrews chapter 6 verses 17 and 18. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. 
Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 to 11. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times, things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, I shall accomplish my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east and the man of counsel for a far country. I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and it will be done. It will be accomplished. He says, I will do it. Dear friend, that's where the power of prayer resides. It resides in the Lord in God. I came upon a poem in my study this week. I don't often quote poems, but I was particularly moved by the depth of this poem. It expresses the raw emotion stemming from tragic challenges that life often brings. Some of you could have the same story because sometimes life has been very tragic and hard and difficult. But in that tragedy, this poem expresses, there emerges a deep understanding of God's goodness. You've been there. I've been there. The poem is entitled, Answered Prayers. And it's written by a lady named Annie Johnson Flint. Even her name depicts a bit of the story, her story. She was born into the Johnson family, Annie Johnson. Three years later, a young sister is born. The mother at the age of 23 dies of childbirth. Her father was not in good health. And he arranged for the children to be cared for via a widow of a, an old army mate of his. But this arrangement did not go well and did not last long. But in accordance to God's good, gracious love, he brought into their lives, Annie and her young sister, the Flint family. And the Flint family raised Annie and her sister. And that was a loving home and a caring home and a home that provided well for her. But in her late teens and early 20s, her mother, which she would call her mother, Mrs. Flint, she became ill and needed the services of care of her daughter, Annie. And her mother dies. And not long after, her father dies, a second time orphaned. And about at the same time, arthritis gripped her body. And it's only a number of years before she is almost completely crippled. And everything that she does is done with pain and it's constant and it's severe. But she has written um, many poems. And this is one that caught my attention that I think speaks to we, where we are often at, meaning the reality of life from my perspective and then the goodness of God from his perspective. Let me read these words. I prayed and then I lost a while all sense of nearness, human and divine. 
The love I leaned on failed and pierced my heart. The hands I clung to loosed themselves from mine. But while I swayed weak, trembling, and alone, the everlasting arms upheld my own. I prayed for light. The sun went down in clouds. The moon was darkened by misty doubt. The stars of heaven were dimmed by earthy fears. But all my candle flames burned out. And while I sat in shadow, wrapped in night, that face of Christ made all the darkness bright. I prayed for peace and dreamed of restful ease. A slumber drugged from pain, a hushed repose. Above my head, the skies were black with storm, and fiercer grew the onslaught of my foes. But while the battle raged and wild winds blew, I heard his voice and perfect peace I knew. I thank thee, Lord. Thou wert too wise to heed my feeble prayers and answer as I sought. Since these rich gifts thy bounty has bestowed have brought me more than I had asked or thought, giver of good, so answer each request with thine own giving better than the best. The Apostle Paul speaks a little bit of this very same thing. We read in 2 Corinthians in chapter 12, starting in verse 7, he's speaking of this concept of the potential of boasting. But he says this, so to keep me from becoming conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was giving me you hear that? A thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. And get this, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. Now Paul comes to a conclusion. Therefore, I will boast more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecution, calamities. For when I am weak, then I am made strong. Did you see that? Paul finally comes to the point of aligning himself with the very purpose of God. He himself prayed, deliver me three times from this thorn in the flesh, but the Lord in his wisdom has something else in store. And Paul's conclusion is, therefore, I will boast more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me dear friend that is oftentimes exactly what happens to us well as we looked at our first time in this little mini series on prayer we looked at matthew chapter 6 where the lord says our father in heaven how old it be your name speaking of the reverence of god in your kingdom come and your will be done well dear friend we are going to have the opportunity to hear from the word of god and so we're going to look at a few scriptures that uh speak of this concept of the power of god but as it rests in the very Lord himself and his ability to work. Our first scripture that we're going to look at is from Luke chapter 22. 
in verse 39 to 46. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there and read with me. This is the most agonizing, difficult uh, uh, passage that we find on prayer. Uh, it is very intense. It is where Jesus is speaking to the Father regarding his impending journey to the cross. And here we see, and I use this word, the agonizing reality of the Lord's humanity. You remember in Hebrews chapter 4, it says, We do not have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Whatever Annie Johnson went through and whatever Paul has gone through, the Lord has experienced it all, yet without sin. If you have your eyes on the scriptures in Luke 22, starting in verse 39, I'm only going to make light commentary on this passage, but Jesus prays. And the scripture says, and he came out and went, and as his custom, to the Mount of Olives. This is a, speaking to the regularity of prayer that Jesus encountered in, and says the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. Going back perhaps to the Lord's prayer, okay? Deliver us from evil, that we would not enter into temptation. Hmm. And so he says to the disciples that you may not enter into this temptation. And then it says that he would, drew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down, saying, Father, if you're willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, listen to these words, not my will, but your will be done. Why? Because it's in the will of the Father where the power is. Uh, Jesus, I don't believe here, is looking at the struggle of going necessarily to the cross at the hands of men. He's not, I don't believe, fearful of that. I think that the struggle is, is that there is going to be a time where the sin of man is going to be laid on Christ. And he's going to become the propitiation for our sin. He's going to become the substitute for our sin. On him is my sin laid. And that wrath of God upon him is what I believe he is speaking of when he says, remove this cup from me. In other words, is there any other way this could happen? But his conclusion, not my will, but your will be done. This point of prayer, this agony of prayer, the Lord here, it tells us, there appeared to him an angel from heaven strengthening him. Of course, need strength. I need strength. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And when I encounter these difficulties, I too pray more earnestly. But dear friend, I am not Jesus. I am merely Dan Keegan. And the propensity of sin in my life is great. But when I turn to God and I'm looking to God for answers, I come to the conclusion, your will be done. And it says that this stress was so great that the sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he arose from the prayer, 
he came to his disciples, and here they are, this is me and you, sleeping for sorrow. And he says to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The Mark account of this passage of scripture speaks that Jesus came back to his disciples three times, and they were sleeping. Here we are, dear friend, sleeping when we could be engaged in the very aspect of my relationship with the Lord, engaged in prayer, turned towards him, coming boldly to the throne of grace, letting my request be known unto him. And it is there that I receive the power. Don't miss the significance of this context, Jesus is going to go to the cross of Calvary. And it is at the cross of Calvary where he will die for our sins. The blood will be shed. He'll be put into the grave. But on the third day, he's going to rise again. And eventually, this is where the power is. We're going to see this in just a moment. Now turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1. I read again for you this morning in verses 15 to 23. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says these words, For this reason, because I have heard your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love towards all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that... The God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom, the revelation and the knowledge of him, having your eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Now get this, verse 19. And what is the immeasurable greatness of of his power towards us who believe. Uh, now, this is what the Lord wants to give to us. According to the working of his great might, power, his great might, that worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. This is this power. And it's a resurrection power. This is what the Lord wants to give us. He wants us to understand this immeasurable greatness of his power towards us. He wants us to know that, to understand it, to receive it. And to be frank with you, dear friends, I am often like, even as Annie mentioned in her poem, I see the clouds and they're so dark. They're so dark. Sometimes I have such a hard time of getting out of there. But then her conclusion, then I see the bright face of Christ. Now would you turn with me to Ephesians in chapter 3. Culminating this great passage of Ephesians chapter 1 through Ephesians chapter 3. The great things that has been accomplished on our behalf in and through Jesus Christ. Starting in verse 14 of Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. That according to the riches. Did you see that? According to the riches of his glory. How rich. How glorious. According to his riches his glory. He may grant to you or grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length, the height, the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Now, listen to this. Now, unto him who is able to do 
immeasurably more or abundantly more or exceedingly abundantly more than all that we could ask or think. Now watch these words, according to the power that worketh within us. What power? The resurrection power. The power over death. Dear friend, there is victory in our relationship that we have with the Lord because of his power that is going to be manifested and granted in and through our lives. So what? And I conclude with these simple thoughts. Ian Bounds, perhaps the most prolific author of this age on the issue of prayer. He says, prayer influences God. Watch this. The ability of God to do for man is the measure of the possibility of power. Think about it this way. Prayer unleashes that measure of the possibility of power because we go to the Lord and we pray according to his will. Dear friend, turning to God, I use this in a very broad way. I say prayer fixes our minds and our patterns of life on God where we find the power. That's what it does. But left to our own, and I say it this way, the exact opposite of prayer, turning from God, but left to our own, we are fatally dependent on our own strength, which is not sufficient for the task. We need to turn to God because that is where the power is. And God will act according to his purpose. And his purpose is always good and right for us. He is the giver of good gifts. I end with this one passage of scripture. It speaks of thy will to be done. It screams, we win. Why? We win because we're strong? No. We win because we are found in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 52 to 58, you know the scripture well. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised and perishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on imperishable, and the mortal body must put on immortality. And when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, the same, God's sayings, God's purpose, God's eternal decrees, that which he desires to accomplish. And this saying, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And all of us can say that. This is not just something that the Apostle Paul is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, which is 
kept in a frame of time right there with Paul. This is for all believers throughout all generations. Because God's testimony is sure and true. The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your faith is not in vain. Aren't those encouraging words? And again, dear friend, that is the very power of prayer. Dear friend, when I'm going through the crisis and the difficulty, the storm clouds are so dark, the pain is so great, I look to the Lord in whom I pray your will be done, just as Jesus and because the will of the Father is accomplished in and through the life of his Son, we have redemption. And he is going to go to a cross there, shed his blood. He's buried. He is risen again. And then it is promised us that by this same power that is the resurrection of the, of the Lord Jesus Christ from the grave, it is by the same power that the Lord wants manifested in and through our lives. And Lord, thank you that you have made available this power. And so, dear friend, whatever your lot is and whatever the problems, when we cry to the Lord, there is victory. It may not be the way we think it is going to be accomplished. Sometimes it is the furthest from that, just as Paul said, you know, deliver me from this thorn in the flesh. Instead, because of our intimacy through prayer, we come to the realization that God's will is what needs to be accomplished. And there is the power. Thank you. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for the power that is ours all because of Jesus, all because of what your accomplishments you desire. And you have said that those who place faith and trust in Christ, they will receive eternal everlasting life in all of the circumstances that will be a testimony of our lives, pale in insignificance to the greatness of the power of the resurrection, which is mine in Christ Jesus. And Lord, I'm here in prayer, recognizing that power and thanking you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.